Hey there everyone, this is Samuel Johnson and welcome back to the Steven Universe Retrospectives. And today, we're going to be discussing episodes 93 and 94 of Steven Universe, Alone at Sea, and Greg the Babysitter. <clears throat> Sorry about that, just had something to eat. Anyway, <clears throat> today we're actually given some... Well, one's a plot and point episode kind of, sort of, and the other's a bit of a lore episode. So, let's get to the plot and point episode first. Alone at Sea is actually a Lapis-centered episode, and what's going on is that Steven's trying... Well, remember how Lapis said that she's kind of taking a break from water after the whole Malachite incident? Well, Steven's trying to break her out of that stupor, as, his, as thanks to his dad's newly acquired moolah... They rented a boat, and they want and Steven wants to take Lapis for a trip. While Lapis is a bit hesitant to do this, Steven does try and goad her, which actually leads to a pretty amusing moment where he where he says, "Come on, we named the boat Little Lappy, named the boat Little Lappy." And when we see the title, it says "SS Misery" before the show getting they tied about tied little or taped little Lappy onto the front, which I think that's hilarious. I don't know why, but either way, that but either way, Lapis decides to. At least, for, at least give this a shot for Steven. So yeah, she so yeah, she does get on the boat, and they they she does get on the boat, and she Steven and Greg, who yeah, she finally gets to meet Greg proper, and he even just he when they even and when he even introduces himself, he says that by the way, you broke. It's like yeah, you broke my leg when you were trying to steal the ocean to get back to your home world. So that's a thing. But either way, yeah, they get on the boat and go out to sea, as the episode as the title of the episode implies, and. For the, and while they're at sea, Steven and Greg are trying to engage Lapis and get her to have fun and enjoy herself. But, well, that's a bit easier said than done. Because, well, unfortunately for them, Lapis is kind of, is, well, it's easier to get someone out of a stupor than you think. Or no, sorry, it's, let me scratch that. It's harder to get them out of a stupor than you think. It's easier said than done is what I meant to say. But put simply Lapis, or put it another way, Lapis is not doing so well out here. When Greg tries to give her the tries to name her the captain of the ship, well, she adamantly refuses to the point where she yells, "Don't put me in charge of anything." When she and Steven are trying to enjoy themselves, she or try and enjoy when she when Steven's trying to get her to enjoy herself, she just kind of seems distant and not and not really listening. When and the only thing that really seems to per perk her up is when she and Steven are doing stuff as Basically, at one point, Steven shows her the boat's horn, and they just spend a good a good chunk of time playing with that. But it's clear that it's a little bit of a struggle for Lapis to enjoy herself here, though she does try and engage in act in various activities. At one point, as at one point after she and Steven are done bl are blowing the horn on the boat, Greg offers to show them to try to show fishing to Lapis, which Lapis does a uh, which Lapis doesn't really fully get, which uh, which. It kind of makes sense. She's still kind of getting used to Earth's customs, which while we got the little while while Steve was trying to engage her, we actually got a funny little moment where they were all drinking orange juice, and Lapis had no idea what it was for, so she started playing with it using her aquakinesis powers. Which I have to say right now, I just realized that Peridot and Lapis are probably two of the most powerful crystal gems, because La as Peridot can control metal, which also not all Peridot has to do mess with our bodies is to is to get is to manipulate the metal in our bodies and since the human body is 90 percent water well that's blood bending right there for lapis but i'm getting sidetracked but either way yeah fishing greg tries showing lapis fishing and while lapis try oh, after he explains everything lapis tries to make things easier by pulling out a chunk well the big blob of water to make everything to, to help him out which steven is impressed by especially since it does actually look pretty cool to see the fish just swimming around in there as it's floating in the air like that but but Lister Greg wants to do it the old-fashioned way. So after so after Lapis kind of embarrassed kind of embarrassed puts the water back in place. Well, they spend a good while waiting for something to grab the line. And sure enough, when something does, Greg does hand the fishing pole over to Lapis and tells her to reel it in. But whatever she whatever they caught is a big one. And as Lapis tries pulling it in, well, as it, you see something start to come to the surface, something definitely big, like Greg said. And then Lapis suddenly kind of just seems to flinch, and suddenly the pole snaps in her arms. As a result of this, well, Greg realizes he bought a pole, but Lapis is still a bit shaken, and not not which is made worse by the fact that as things go along, that shortly after this, they end up getting some ten some engine problems with the boat as so as it suddenly gets shaken up, and it's just kind of cr and just comes to a halt. 
And when St and when Greg calls Steven to come help him, yeah, they don't they don't hear the engine. So it's clear that something isn't right. And sure enough, as they're si as they're just kind of si and sure enough, shortly after this, well, the engine blows. And since Greg has no idea how to fix an engine, he realizes that he, Steven, and Lapis are probably going to be stuck out here for a while. Well, as such, well, Steven goes to tell the Lapis and get and parts about her the bad news, but. She's still distant. Steven, at this point, starts apologizing that this is his fault. He's the one that pushed her to come out here. But Lapis, well, Lapis admits that part of the reason why she's so distant is, yes, she is still thinking of her time as Malachite, about how she fought so hard to keep keep to keep control, to push Jasper down and keep and and, and just make and just make, make sure everything was under control. But, while Steven tries to show her, no, it's okay, you're not a part of that anymore, you're not trapped under there, Lapis admits another reason why she's been thinking about Malachite. She misses it. Which shocks Steven something fierce. Especially since Lapis, like, the reason why Lapis misses being Malachite is because she, is because, well, Basically, thing. Well, we'll get to that. Actually, you know, I'll get to that in a minute. But simply, Stephen is shocked by this, and he does say that 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 why would she want that back? That, that what would happen with her and Jasper was horrible. But Lapa says, "I'm horrible. I was horrible. I did all these terrible things. I stole your oh shit. I hurt your dad. Why? It's like why don't you see me? In the, why don't you? Like, why you should see me as this monster? But in the middle of all this, the boat gets shaken again." And we soon see what's been keeping the boat in place as we as when we see the anchor on the side of the boat as we see the anchor on the side of the boat, well, and something is climbing up it. And sure enough, when Stephen and Lapis see what it is, uh, see and uh, yeah, Stephen and Lapis see what it is as it climbs onto the poop deck, and we soon learn that it's Jasper, who it turns out has been following the group, specifically Lapis. As such, Steven immediately gets on the defensive as he summons his shield, and Jasper just kind of laughs at him, thinking that, "Why? Like, oh, really? Does this does this puny run this pu this run version of Rose Quartz work for you now?" And he, Jasper even states that Steven's pointing the shield the wrong way because, in Jasper's words, she thought she was a monster, but Lapis, Lapis is a brute. And yeah. To kind of clarify that further, based on dialogue they have in a few minutes, like a minute, that's, yeah. based on what we infer from the dialogue after this, yeah, it's, she's talking exclusively about Malachite because apparently, well, remember back when me and Haley looked at the Chilatid episode and we saw how hard Lapis was fighting just to keep Jasper under control. Well, apparently she there, she fought a lot harder than we were led to believe, because apparently she got brutal. And I mean, like very brutal. Apparently, Jasper, like Jasper, is supposed to be this big, strong, tough gem that nobody can match in terms of power, and yet Lapis was able to keep beating her down, and not just beat her down. She apparently just kept. She apparently wasn't just. Let me put it this way. She wasn't just beating her for the sake of making sure she didn't get control of Malachite. She was venting on her. She was hurting her. She was she was essentially she was essentially she was just doing everything in her power to harm her, to cause her pain, just doing just essentially being abusive. She was hurting Jasper and she, and the fact she was hurting Jasper so greatly. And yes, they were. It was a. It was a fight and a struggle to keep ja to keep Malachite under control, and it does take two to tango. But based on the way Jasper and Lapis are talking, it sounds to me like, like Lapis did most of the fighting, and not just because she wanted to keep Jasper under. It sounds to me like, based on what they say, that Jasper was essentially Lapis's punching bag, and well, the reason why Jasper is hunting Lapis. She wants it back too. Yep. She ends up, after she knocks Steven aside, she ends up grabbing Lapis's hand, falls to her knees, and, be, and just pre starts begging Lapis so that they can to be Malachite with her again. Because, well, like, yeah, because she thinks that Lapis has all this anger built up and Jasper's the only one that can take it, but Malachite was so much 
better than them both. They were strong. They were powerful. They could fly. And Lapis, when she hears all this, is just rightfully horrified. Like, why the hell would you want that? What we had was sick. I hurt you so bad. I hated you so much. I needed to hate you. I needed to hurt you. But ja but Jabba's like, Jasper's like, no, 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 no. It'll be different now. I know you've made, you've changed me. It's all for the better. Just come on. We can do this. We can make it something better now. And it's just, it's just hor It's just disturbing and horrifying. And the way you see Lapis reacting to it all, it's clear she kind of wants to say yes again. It's like when she hears Jasper pleading with her, she wants to jo go back to it. There's a part of her that wants it back to be able to be this thing again and to, and what I'm guessing, continue using Jasper as a punching bag, which I think Jasper's okay with just because she wants the extra power. And as we learn, and essentially Jasper respects power above all, all else. And, but thing is, all it takes is Lapis to have a, little, a quick glance at Steven, and her response is an abj is a whole, is a firm and hard no, because but the, because at the end of the day, Malachite was unhealthy. It was a it was abusive. Ja it, br it brought out the worst in Lapis and Jasper, and put simply, ja Lapis does not want that. She doesn't want to go through that again. And it's no matter, and regardless of how much Jasper wants to get it back, well, no means no, she's not doing it. And while Jasper does try and plead with Lapis again, Stephen, pr Stephen yells at Jasper that Lapis said no, and so Jasper immediately sees this and thinks, oh, you did this, kid. And tries to go and tries to go and pick a fight with Steven, which results in Lapis getting all getting, which results in Lapis in pa in a panic, summoning a giant water fist to punch her through the boat and send Jasper flying. Which, it's fun. It's it's fun. So yeah, it's fun. But either way, yeah. At this point, at this point, Greg hears the commotion and well, he comes out and sees a giant hole in his ship. And yeah, a giant hole in his ship. Yeah, that, that thing's not staying afloat. As such, the as such, Galapis takes Stephen and Greg and flies away with the boat just sinking, and Greg realizing he has now bought the boat instead of renting it. But at but in the end, in the end, as Stephen and has the trio are flying away, Stephen remarks to Lapis how the ocean looks a bit more serene today, and Lapis, she actually agrees. So, it's nice. It's it's a quaint, sweet little ending. So there you go. But now we get to Greg the babysitter, and well. This is actually another flashback episode, and the framing device for this one is that Greg is apparently doing good business at the car wash, getting two whole cars, which apparently he hasn't had that much business since something called a mud nato. As such, she, as such, Stephen remarks about how he didn't know his how long his father actually worked at the car wash, and so Greg is ready to tell Stephen the story. Which at this point we now get to the trend of Stephen wanting his dad to always start any story with a song. Sorry, still digesting the food. Now, as such, we get a song called I Think I Need a Little Change, which is essentially a montage of Greg as he is now in a very happy relationship with Rose. And it is pretty cool. And yeah, it is pretty nice. And the song is just essentially about Greg, how he's, how he's content to be with Rose, how he loves spending time with her, doing things with her, and how if he could, he would spend all day worshipping the ground she walked on and just having fun with her. There's just one problem. That don't pay the bills. Yeah, well, Greg is clear. Well, Greg and Rose clearly are having fun with each other and doing a lot of fun couples things like reading trashy stories together, playing, dancing, and just kind of going on out and just going on outings together. Well, in between things, in between time, in between their little outings, Greg really isn't doing anything, and little by little, he's kind of turning into a bum. As his, as he's taking baths in the ocean, his his clothes are getting are getting scraped, especially since well the the wire fence is still up, and since there's a hole cut out of it for Greg to walk through, he cuts it he he rips his pants on it, and sadly because he's not making any money, he can't afford anything to eat, only getting food out of the garbage. And while he does try and get raise money by playing songs on the boardwalk, well he he gets a, he pretty much just gets a dollar and a few bottle caps, not really enough, to, not even enough to buy as he puts it a bad hot dog. 
As such, Greg usually spends the as such Greg usually spends most of his time loafing on Vidalia's couch. Which yeah, Vidalia now at this point has given has now given birth to her and, and Marty's son, Sour Cream, who is who I love seeing little baby Sour Cream as he does as he ha, he ha, like he looks all the same amount of chill that he does as a teenager. Like his voice is even the same. It's it's weird. But either way. But either way, Vidalia is still is taking care of her baby, and Greg be, and Greg being the bum, he's just kind of mooching off of her, so to speak. He's not like he's trying to be a mooch, but he is. He's a mooch. He as he takes her food, where he, he takes her food, watches her TV, causes a mess on her couch, and at one point, at one point when he ends up spilling a bowl, ends up spilling a bowl of cereal he got, he ends up get he ends up getting it all over her shirt, and Vidalia and Vidalia demands that she that he get to get undressed and give and give her, and give her his shirt so she can clean it. However, it's all, however, Vidalia actually does. Ha Vidalia has also gotten a job working at the t-shirt shop. Now, or, yeah, Vidalia's gotten a job working at the t-shirt shop. Okay, good. Tongue twister avoided. And pretty, and unfortunately, well, her babysitter canceled because apparently the babysitter's hamster died. It was a 12-year-old kid. As such, kind of out of options, Vidalia charges Greg with looking after her kid, and since Greg has nothing better to do, he takes he, he accepts the job. Though Vidalia warns him that if anything happens to Sour Cream, she will end him. As such, Greg decides to take Sour Cream to the beach, and while they and while there, they end up running into Rose, who well, she just kind of goes gaga over the little baby Sour Cream, which also does lead to a kind of a nice little moment, which I might talk about later if I can remember it. But put simply. It's just a nice little moment where Rose talks about how it took her a while to figure out that a baby and an adult human are the same thing, which in a way kind of makes sense. Again, keep in mind that because according to what we learn about gems, when they are when they're born, they don't come they don't start small and then get and grow. They pop out fully formed, knowing exactly what they're supposed to do. They are essentially like full. They're essentially like they're essentially adults by the time they turn a second old, and pretty. And so, and as and the thing is, as we learn from as we learn in previous episodes, gems don't age the way humans do. Scratch that. They don't age at all. They don't. They don't grow up. They're just this one thing forever whatever their purpose is that's what they're supposed to be for that's what they're supposed to be that's what they're always supposed to be that's their role in life etc and ro and as a result of the but and so to see and so when rose sees that humans grow up actually start small and then get older she admires it she likes that and in her own words she thinks that's an amazing power the power to grow to change the power to grow up it's actually a really sweet sentiment especially when you hear it coming out of rose's mouth because it is a very interesting thing and i think does feed into her whole character arc which again i'm not going to mention the spoiler but i'm going to pretend that it was mentioned prior to make the sense again just trying to avoid spoilers but Haley, again if you're watching this you know what spoiler i'm talking about and i still blame you for that but either way yeah, Greg hears the speech and he's like, "Wow, that's amazing!" And I gotta, I gotta write that down. Hold on, watch Sour Cream. I'll be right back. And so he runs off. So he runs off while Rose watches Sour Cream. But when Greg comes back with his guitar, the pair are gone. He doesn't know where. And so Greg justifiably freaks out and runs around Beach City trying to find them, and eventually manages to find them at the Funland at the Funland Amusement Park. Or most specifically, he finds Rose at the Funland Amusement Park. As he asks where Sour Cream is. Rose points the Ferris wheel, and it turns out she let the kid climb all the way to the top because this is supposed, and, and she even thinks this will be a formative experience for the child. And meanwhile, Greg is kind of losing his shit and realizes he's got to get the kid down from there before he falls. As such, Greg ends up climbing up the Ferris wheel and does manage to grab sour cream, but now it becomes a matter of him getting down because when the incident he looks down, he gets a bit of vertigo and clings to the cart that he's on. As such, when Rose tries to work the Ferris wheel controls to get Greg down, sadly she just makes things worse, and the Ferris wheel goes out of control to the point where she ends to the point where she ends up breaking the lever, and the thing just won't stop spinning. And as such, when Rose ends up, as such, Rose trying to keep everything in control manages to stop the Ferris wheel with brute force. But all this does is says Greg gets sour cream flying. As such, she manages to grab one of the carts and uses it as a cradle to catch the pair. But Greg, but and while Greg is, but while Greg is happy that he and Sour Cream are okay, 
she does ask Rose why she let him just climb up there like that. You can't just let him do whatever. You can't just let a baby do whatever she want, whatever he wants. And Rose's response is, "Well, you do whatever you want." And Greg's like, "Oh, come on." It's like, I'm not a baby. I don't need people to take care of me or, fe or feed me or wash my clothes or, or save me or save me or get me down from at Ferris wheel. And oh my God, I am a baby, which yeah, the instant Greg realizes this, it just kind of, it gives him a bit of clarity as much after he gets, after Rose helps him get down from his carriage, he does bring sour cream back to Vidalia. And at this point he thinks he might need to do some soul searching. And as such, after Vidalia offers to give him back his shirt, he does not give a proper response. He ends up going for a walk, and as he's walking around, that's when he finds the car wash, and there's a help wanted sign in the do in the in the window. And so that's how he wound up getting the job there. And so that ends as such. The episode ends with cutting back to present day as Stephen as Stephen and as Greg tells Stephen that not everybody wants to grow up, but every but it's something that we have to do, and it's something that only you can choose to do, which. Might be overdue on that. But either way, what Steven does soon ask, hey, what happened to baby sour cream? Greg says, nobody knows. And the episode ends with sour cream just walking in the background going, meh. Which implies that he might have heard a bit of that story. So that's funny. But either way, yeah, that's that episode. So my thoughts on both episodes. First, Alone at Sea. This episode, I think it's a good one because it furthers, because again, it furthers along Lapis's development and like me and Haley talked about in the Chilatine episode, really gets into the nitty gritty of why her relationship with Jasper as Malachite was a very bad thing. Like, as I mentioned before, fusions are essentially meant to be allegories for different forms of a relationship sometimes intimate sometimes emotional but in the end but all but basically different allegories for different for people coming together and just forming something new and in this case the Ma jasper and lapis's malachite fusion was a very much an allegory for an abusive relationship as when we what we saw in chillateed was essentially lapis just doing everything in her power to keep the beat Jasper down, keep her under, keep her under control and to keep Malachite from going nuts. But the thing is, this, the alone, it's this episode alone at sea further showcases ju just how abusive it truly was. And ultimately it helps reorganize. It helps showcase just how bad, just how much, uh, just it helps essentially categorize who is the abusee and who is the abuser in the relationship? And well, while Lapis definitely took her fair share of licks from from Jasper and the in that, as like I said, it takes two to tango when one is when you, one is fighting someone off. Based on what we learn in this episode, it's clear that the one doing the most hurting in this in between the two was Lapis. And I don't mean that in the sense of, oh, she was getting hurt. No, I mean she was beating Jasper down. Not just to keep Jasper in line, but because she needed something to take her anger out on. Something to hurt. And honestly, that kind of makes sense. Keep in mind that when Lapis and Jasper first fused into Malachite, Jasper J Lapis's first words were, I am it's like, I am not going to be made a prisoner anymore. Now you're my prisoner. This is, this is a case, this showcases that the Malachi fusion was not just being upheld because Jasper wanted the power. It was being upheld because Lapis was essentially trapping Jasper in it. Keep in mind that when Jasper realized what Lapis was doing, she tried to unfuse, but Lapis would not let her. And, that, and but at the same time, though, and, but at the same time, though, this also showcases that in the midst of all this, Lapis was not just holding on to her because she needed to keep Steven safe. She, it's because she needed something to punch, something to hurt, something that she could take her anger out on. And honestly, I do understand that mindset. I do understand that anger boiling over, having so much shit just rattling around in your head that you need to take it out on something. But... The thing is, what can def what, oh, but the thing is, you gotta learn to have a healthy outlet with that, and it's clear that in the case of Lapis, her outlet was not exactly healthy. It's, it's like I said, she was hurting Jasper. She was keeping her down, and yeah, Jasper was one of the bad guys, but for for Lapis, she she needed to take it out on her. She needed something to hurt, and when it's all over, she misses it, which. 
Yeah, I yeah yeah. It's it's scary when she says that. The fact that she at the point that the basically that she that base that she forms such an emotional crutch with hurting Jasper that badly that even when that even when she knows this was a bad thing, I can't do this anymore. There's still a part of her that yearns for it, that wants it back, because there was comfort in that. There was comfort in having a stress outlet, for having something that she could take her anger out on. And the way that we see it portrayed in the episode is actually really not, it's actually really good because throughout the episode, you can see that Lapis is deeply regretful of, of who she was, not just before the fusion, but during the fusion. She is regretful over what she had to do in order to keep Malachite in line, or what she wanted to do to try and take her anger out. She was not, like, she didn't like that. Like, it's, like, it's clear that there is a part of her that regrets how she acted in that moment because throughout the episode she's afraid of being out at sea she her, she keeps thinking about it and going back to when greg offered her the captain's hat she when i remember when i told you that she said oh I, it's like no don't put me in charge well if you want to get technical when it came to malachite when she was in charge she was beating down on on jasper so odds are there is still odds are she could still be regretting the fact that she might be genuine that she's afraid of what will happen if she was put in another position of power. What would she do with it? And when you have that, and when you're essentially put in that position and you do abuse it to hurt others, yeah, you can if you if you genuinely want to change. Such situations can leave you scared to to, to get back into that position. If for fear of essentially slipping back into your old ways, which is what we see with Lapis here. And ultimately, I think what makes her different from Jasper, because while Lapis misses the misses Mal the fusion of Malachite, she also was fully aware that the Malachite fusion was unhealthy, that, the that what she was doing to Jasper was wrong, the wrong way of, of venting out her anger. And likewise, when Jasper comes back and pretty much tells her, no, pretty much says, let's be Malachite again. I want we, you we show me the benefits of it and it'll be different now. I can take it. It'll be fine. She's, it's just scary. The way, ja hell, the way Jasper crawls back to her, wanting more, wanting to still, wants to be, wanting to get back, wanting to recreate what they had before, despite how toxic it was, how harmful it was for both of them but she still wants it she still clings to it and when she does ask it when she asks for it it leads to is jasper ne or lapis nearly says yes but what ultimately stops lapis from saying yes from slipping back into her old ways is steven which is a major part of lapis's character arc from this point forward because well, put simply, as we learn later on, especially in future, Lapis Lazulis are not kind. They are not nice. They fulfill, in the gem hierarchy, they exist to terraform and destroy. That is what they, that's what they're there for. And they can, when you have that much power, you have to be, you have to not think about who gets hurt or who's caught in the crossfire. And likewise, we did see that with Lapis in the beginning. She did not care about anybody but herself. Now, again, she was trapped in a mirror for thousands of years, so of course she would be not. She wouldn't really care. But remember, but keep in mind, she was willing to take the Earth's ocean to try and get out to get off Earth. It's she didn't. So it's clear that there what that she really what could. So it's clear that when it came to getting her way, she was not mindful of who she had to hurt in order to get it. But like, but the thing is, what makes Lapis want to be better? is Steven, because like I said, Steven is one of the few crystal gems who has shown her kindness. Well, hell, he's, he, he's one of the first people that's shown her kindness. He has helped her. He's stood by her in her best and her worst. He's always been there, encouraging her, helping her. And ultimately, through it's because of that friendship that Lapis wants to be better. And this analogy kind of reminds me of a web show that I that I watched when I was younger, Do oh, specifically Doctor Who's, which if you don't know, it's essentially Doctor Who, but he's been transported to a quest from My Little Pony. And a few years back, two Doctor Who's, two Doctor Who's audio series, Doctor Who's an assistant and Doctor Who's adventures wound up having a crossover as the doctors from both of those shows wound up switching places and going into the other's universes and 
as a result of this, they had, as a result, both doctors and the companions from both realities were trying to do whatever they could to undo the switch and put everything back to normal because, well, there was an interdimensional monster that was trying to kill them and that was trying to destroy the foundations of reality so that it could escape into the multiverse and consume entire worlds. So that's, you know, not typical sci-fi shenanigans. But either way, for one point in the crossover, both doctors wound up in the same universe while both of their companions were in another. And when both doctors are in the same room together, they had a very serious conversation. Basically, because here's the thing. The one doctor, the doctor from Doctor Who's an assistant, he was not handling things well. He was getting impatient and he was afraid. And the thing is, this the, 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 the assistant doctor... Or the doctor, doctor who's an assistant was a bit was a very jovial fellow. Loved all the loved all the horse related terminology in Equestria. He loved everything. He laughed and had fun. He was a bit more childish, while his adventure counterpart was a bit more stalwart and what more was a bit more stalwart and more seer and more just curious and just kind of what basically th think of it like if the eleventh doctor and the twelfth doctor are in the same room together. But in this case, one's not an old, one's not an old but a Scottish curmudgeon, and one's a bit and the other's a bit more childish. But either way. But I'm getting sidetracked. Essentially, the, the doctor from Doctor Who's an assistant was getting impatient, and in his impatience, he started letting his dark side out. He began doing things that the doctor wouldn't do. Case in point, in both realities, the doctors and their companions are being pursued by monsters. In one reality, the doctor managed to trick it into going into Poison Joke and turning into a salamander. In the other reality, the one that the, the doctor from Doctor Who's an assistant was trapped in, he gouged its eyes out. And then when it came back again... He chopped its head off. And the instant that the Doctor from Doctor Who's Adventures learns this, he's horrified. And that's what leads, and it leads to this whole big argument between the two as they both are trying to justify their methods. One side trying to showcase, talk, saying that there's a va that they have to show mercy, they need to, while the other says, oh, how many times does showing mercy come back and bit us in the ass? And they le leave good arguments, but one point, and that's what ultimately leads back into what I'm trying to get at here, it's the show. It's basically the reasons we're showing mercy. Basically, the a doctor from Doctor Who's an assistant says that. Yeah, it's like I'm not like when your mercy fails. I'm just. It's like I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna just stand by and let you show your mercy. You can try and show it when you want, but if it doesn't work, I'm not gonna let that. I'm not just gonna let everything stand. So, so when so you and your mercy can pretty much go shove it. Again, I'm not quoting verbatim. It's been a while since I've listened to the audio. But to this, the the, the adventure, the doctor from Doctor Who's adventures laughs, because the thing is. He's old, he's tired, and he's been the doc. And this is Doctor Who. This is the Doctor from post re from the revival of Doctor Who, the one who's seen more shit than any. Uh, basically, the Doctor who's seen more shit than all, most of his previous incarnations. And so, when he t when he thinks back on mer on be basically mercy, he says that everything they've been through it drains the mercy out of you. But what makes him want to keep showing mercy and want to keep doing good? are because of his companions. All the mercy he has are is borrowed and it's from and he shows mercy for them because the their, the doctor's companions need him to show mercy. What ha that he has to show mercy gently for them. And yes, it's borrowed, but he treasures it more than anything. And that's what we see with Lapis here. Lapis does keep trying to slip do, there's a part of Lapis that clearly wants to slip back into how she was before, to be uncaring, to be cruel, to be angry at the world for what was done to her. Hence, what it's part it's part of why she wants to be Malachite again, why she abused Japis, the, Jasper the way she did when they refused. But she wants to be better because of Stephen. When she's with Stephen, she wants to be a better person. She sees the friendship he gives her when they're together, and she wants to be worthy of that friendship and it's because of that that every time she's weak she looks to she, she looks to steven it's why she gets the strength to tell jasper to screw off when jasper when jasper says she wants to for them to fuse back into malachite it's how she's able to get to muster the strength to keep to tell her to leave it's why she was willing to stay on earth and even help the crystal gems with their problem with la with, the, with the rubies because steven asked it's because of Steven that she wants to be better. And it's for Steven that she tries to be better. And I think that that's a really interesting point or character arc. Because, again, Steven is one of the few people who's been genuinely kind to her. And I think it actually works to... And I think it overall 
works. It does well in not only showcasing the mindset that can go into a toxic relationship and how, despite how even if both sides know this is not healthy, there is something about them that just keeps pulling them back in that makes them want to be a part of it. But ultimately, you have. But ultimately, what break what makes you have to stop makes you re have to realize that. But at the end, you have to realize that they're not healthy. That and being and if you're in this relationship, all it's going to do is hurt everyone involved. And the only way to end it and the only way to fix everything is to just end it. And while there is always going to be a part of you that misses it, the best way to best way to keep that part silent is to is to recognize the toxic parts of the of the relationship, and to essential and to just cut it out. And that's what Lapis does in the end. Despite Jasper begging her, despite all the pleading, she tells Jasper to screw off. And I think that that works, both as a good character moment for Lapis to help showcase her growth and to kind of showcase a good little analogy. And I think it does showcase a good analogy for abusive relationships in a way that I think kids can understand. So, yeah, I think that's the real strength of Alone at Sea. So, good on you for that episode. Good on you. As for Greg the Babysitter... I think this episode works, again, not just as a flashback episode... Basically, how the episode works is not just that it's fun as a flashback episode, as it's always cool to see more of Greg when he, in his, when he was in relationship with Rose, but it also does continue furthering along more character stuff. The moral at the end, I think, is a good one that adult... That it is something you need to know, that basically everybody has to grow up, but you have to decide when you grow up. It's something you have to do at some point, but it has to be a choice you make, and as I said, I'm bit overdue on that but at the same time it is but again it is, it is you can't really be even if you are an adult you do need to make that decision and eventually you do need it is something you have to come to terms with and in the end when greg realizes just how badly his life's kind of gone downhill as like i said he was mooching off vidalia and spending most of his time with with rose yeah he realized yeah, I, I think I might need to get my life back. Get, I need to get my life in order and actually try and do something to be stable. So it's it's a good lesson. I think it works, and I do like how it's how it's dispensed. But another little thing I like too is the stuff with Rose. The stuff with Rose, I think, isn't good. Is a good job at not just showcasing more of her personality because it's always nice seeing more of Rose's personality, but also more into her character. Kind of case in point, I like the bubbliness that Rose uh, that Rose displays when she sees sour cream and how when she's hanging out with Greg, which again does showcase just that the relationship has grown since we last saw the pair because well that that Rose definitely took what Greg said to heart and they've been forming a genuine relationship ever since. Like going back to the like going back to the song montage at the beginning of the story, there's at one point where Greg is seeing the Crystal Gems officer off to, as they're going on a mission, and basically each of them have a different greeting. We like grow. Like Amethyst, like Amethyst kind of bu like bumps arm uh, bumps arms with him. Pearl just brushes him off. He gives like a Garnet a high five, and Rose pulls him in for a kiss because you know, they're sweethearts. It's sweet. I like it. But by the end, but the thing is, with Rose, with Rose here, it also showcases that. Well, it helps further showcase that she ain't the great mystical leader that we've seen her as, which. Yeah, we I know we've we've established that in previous episodes, but this one really pulls really kind of drives it home because this is la probably Rose at her most clueless. Like she talks about how when she first came to Earth and and she had to come to the terms of the fact that babies grow up into adults, it was something that she couldn't wrap her head around because that's not normal for gems. The normal for them is coming out of the ground fully formed. So learning that that, that there's a rate that humans are people that have to grow into their identities, it was interesting for her, and I kind of like that as. It feels like, because to gems, growing up is essentially a power in and of itself. They can't do that, and yet humans can. It's actually pretty profound and interesting, but the way Rose interprets it, I think is really well done. As she talks about how humans are never expected to be the same, even moment to moment. They have to grow, develop, become their own being, and it's... I do like the way that Rose talks about it, which, considering her history and what led to her essentially becoming who she is now, that makes sense. It explains so much about why she is why she admires humans so much. That be unlike gems, they are expected to change. They are expected to grow. They're always they're expected to all to keep moving forward. Whereas for gems, they're just. They're just supposed to have a single role and then be in that role for the rest of their lives. It's honestly depressing. And the way that Rose kind of interprets that and how she essentially, in a way, idolizes it is interesting. And it does kind of further feed into it, especially considering, which I'm not going to give spoilers here, but let's put it this way. 
Rose does have some skeletons in her closet, and they are not pretty. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that dog stuff. But like I said, Rose does have some skeletons in her closet, and without giving anything away, some of them are a bit more dirty than others. And consider, and the thing is, Rose did want to change. She wanted to become better than who she was before. And she definitely, and she tried hard. She tried damnedest, but even then, and even then she still did some things that you wouldn't exactly like, which we'll learn about in the future, which we'll learn about in episodes to come. Trust me on this. But basically, from, basically, the fact that Rose sees these people who, for them, change is not just something that they do, but is expected of them, it makes sense why she would idolize them this much. Why she would look at them and think, I want to be that. I want to be a part of that. I want to see more of this, which, in a way, I think further explains why she not only wanted to protect Earth, but why she wanted to have Steven. Because, as I meant, because Steven, well, he's a unique case. Among, because he is a gem who can change. He's not born with a predetermined purpose. He's his own person. He can grow up. He can, de he can decide what he wants to be, unlike other gems who pop out of the ground knowing what they're supposed to be. I think it's very interesting to think about, and in a way, and I think it's very interesting to think about, and in a way, it really does help give a window into Rose's character, and ultimately give some hints as to what ha what which we learn about her later. So, I do think that that works as a character part, as a basically, as more character for Rose. I think it does a good job at showcase at showcasing the person beneath the legend, and add on the good mo and the moral with Greg. I think is nice and does some is. Definitely something that I think some kids need should learn, or in some in the case, some adults need to learn. And on top of that, the rest of the episode, it's nice. It's uh, it, the rest of the episode is ultimately fine. It's again still kind of fun. See, it's it's fun seeing Greg as a young man as he just keeps coasting through life. The opening song is 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 catchy as most Steven Universe songs are. The humor with Greg as he and the and him trying to take care of sour cream is. Honestly, funny. I love seeing him running around. As at one point, he stops at the arcade. He's playing a video game while he's searching for them. The whole thing with the Ferris wheel is honestly some nice little, some nice little slapstick comedy. Especially as everything goes wrong, he directly quotes he direct Greg directly quotes quotes George Jetson. He says, "Rose, get me off this crazy thing." It's, it's fun. I like that. And even by the end, when Greg does have his revelation, there's still some nice comedy in there. As Vidali asks, "Hey, do you want your shirt's clean? You want it back, or are you just gonna take a stroll in your? Or are you just gonna take a stroll in your bed? Or are you just gonna take a stroll with just your pants?" And he's like, "Hey, we gotta grow up sometime." He walks off, and she says, "That information is not relevant to my question." It's it's funny. It's amusing. So it's I like it over. I like it overall. So yeah, on the whole, on the whole, Alone at Sea is I think is a really de is a really damn good episode. That really does that really does help showcase. It does make it that does help kind of showcase an abu abusive an abusive relationship in a way that I think kids can understand and kind of work through. While also giving some good character stuff for Lapis and but and on top and. Greg the Babysitter is a fun little jaunt that not only has some nice character stuff with Rose and how she views humanity, but also has some nice, but also has some nice antics with Greg as he as he tries to deal with Rose and baby sour cream, while also giving a nice little moral at the end about eventually having to learn to grow up. So, yeah, on the whole, both really good episodes. I thought I, enjoy, I thoroughly enjoyed them. So, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you for watching. I'm Samuel Johnson, and I hope to end well next week. Well, put it simply, we haven't seen the last of Jasper. She's doing, she's up to something, but we're gonna, it's gonna have to be a while. We're gonna have to figure out what that is as we see next week's episode. So till then, I hope you have a good night. It's kind of getting kind of hot in here, so I think I need to turn a fan on. And I hope to see you next week as we see more of Jasper and her antics, so to speak. So until then, like I said, hope you have a good night and take care.